want to introduce our panelists, Chris Reed. Um, you saw a slide, actually, of one of Chris's projects um, during the slideshow um, from Seoul, Korea. He is a principal of Stoss Landscape Urbanism, uh, whose work focuses on water-based urban planning from Milwaukee to Shanghai uh, to Seoul, Korea. Um, he also teaches at Harvard's Graduate School of Design, uh, where his core studio last year addressed dynamic coastal landscapes. He wrote one of the articles in the magazine about his uh, work redesigning the Chani Chang River um, in Seoul, uh, Korea. Just, just to clarify, that's yeah. not our project. I've written about that project. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, 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 that's okay. Oh, well, pardon me. And he built the Suez Canal. Uh, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> the editor regrets the error. <laughs> Next to him, uh, Nina Chase of Sasaki Associates. Um, her team was chosen by the U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Sean Donovan, to develop reconstruction and resiliency plans for the East Coast after Hurricane Sandy. Uh, this rebuild by design competition um, takes into account the specific uh, coastal geographies of each different community and custom designs uh, strategies for each. Um, Hubert Murray. Uh, is an architect uh, and uh, contributing editor to Architecture Boston Magazine. That's his most important uh, credential. Um, he has worked in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, um, but most recently uh, is the manager of sustainable initiatives for Partners Healthcare. Um, he helped design the Spalding uh, Rehab Facility at the Charlestown Navy Yard, which is recognized as a uh, kind of a model climate-ready facility. My erstwhile colleague at the Boston Globe, Tom Ashbrook, uh, you all know Tom from his outstanding work at WBUR's On Point. Uh, I knew him when he was an ink-stained wretch, a foreign correspondent uh, based in Asia and a newsroom editor. Um, I know he will steer this conversation tonight with skill, passion, and smarts. So please join me in welcoming them all here tonight. Thank you, Renee. Thank you very much. I, ho I hope this is not inconvenient, but could we have the map of Boston back? Is that possible? Do, do we have a guru who could reproduce that? The one that vanished before the video? <laughs> Maybe not. Well, th there it is over on the wall. That's a version of it. Um, first of all, thank you very much, everybody, for coming here tonight. And the first question I want to ask my panel, uh, while I, while I um, channel Rush Limbaugh, because we're talking about climate change and global warming, and if you came here tonight, you know it's too damn cold. So what global warming are we talking about? First problem, right? Uh, it, it is eminently deniable. The coldest weather in New York, I think, in 100 years, I heard today. And people are not quickly going to go for this. Secondly, you've got very subtle and supple, I've read a lot about them, responses to what's going on. But let's say, we'll see if this map comes. Um, let's say I'm running for governor in the year 2026 which is not that long from now. And we've had a dozen hellacious years in Boston of sea rise and flooding. We've seen terrible infrastructure, I mean, great infrastructure knocked out downtown. We've seen, I don't know, we've seen the ocean run into the public garden. You know, Frog Pond become an extension of Boston Harbor. And I'm running for office, and I don't want to hear about all of your subtle things and what I want to do. I know Renee wrote in her introduction here that the last thing we can do the one thing we can't do is emulate the heroic little Dutch boy with his finger in the dike. But I'm running for governor in 2026, and it's been living hell around here, and we're building a wall right here from Castle Island to Logan Airport. Am I wrong? We're going to sacrifice Morrissey Boulevard. We're going to flood. Maybe the JFK Library has to go under. But we're going to save Don Chiafaro's building over here <laughs> and the rest of downtown Boston. And am I wrong? Uh, yes. Why? Not bold enough. Not bold enough, I can yeah. save. I've looked at the maps, six foot rise in a hundred years. I've looked at the yellow and the pink and where it's deep and how the water comes deep. It looks, uh, it, you know, it almost encircles Beacon Hill, but it looks to me that if we put the wall right there with a levee in it, with a, with a, with a whatever in it, let the ships come in and out, the, the gambling barges that go in and out to Everett, um, <laughs> that we can save a lot of downtown <laughs> Boston and the rest be damned. Well. Okay, I, I think the short answer is you push it further out, you push it further out to here or to here, where you've got natural land formations and making it easy to bridge. Oh, you, oh so you're willing to entertain a wall? Uh, you, mean, you mean a wall here yeah. and here? So, oh. 
Isn't that still I, the I big think finger the, in the dark? The essence of this is that it's not just about saving ourselves from catastrophe. It's actually looking at an opportunity to solve all sorts of other problems at the same time. That's what we as designers do. You're, you're faced with a tricky site and you design around it and produce something fantastic. You're faced with a tricky situation such as we have here. You don't answer just the one problem. You actually use it to keep the CNG tankers out of the harbor. You use it for recreational purposes. You use it to keep the harbor clean and so on and so on. So you layer things upon that one solution. Well, okay, and that's so, so you're, that's, a, that's a good opening answer, but let me continue to be a boorish politician for a minute with a lot of public rage and upset at my back. And I'm like, the hell with your nuance and subtlety. Yes, there's a lot of things we can do, but the first thing we're going to do, okay, then fine, Hubert. You're, you're chairman of the new commission. We're putting the walls here and here. What's wrong with that? You well, there are a couple things wrong with it. First of all, it will push the water to other places. The idea that you, well, yeah, right. Boston's strong. <laughs> Boston's strong, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's their problem. But what, what, what's interesting is you raise Why push a problem. it to New York? This is, this is a regional issue. It's not a local issue. It's not, a, it's not an issue that's going to be solved at the scale of a single site, although an accumulation of sites will start to address it. By building a dike, you also have to remember that you're not just keeping water out, you're keeping water in. It's not just raining outside. Can't we dike. circulate that with it's, big pipes? And well, yeah, sure, but then those things fail. Um, and they're not designed to the thousand year flood capacity. New York was a thousand year storm. Nobody in their right mind is gonna design to that capacity. The idea that you just let some of that water in during these events, um, is is a it, I don't think that's a nuanced idea. I think it's a, a an idea that says you know change our mindset so that we can better address the situation. Nina, help me just a little more here. Um, you say if I build these walls and I protect all of this precious interior, so we can live like we've always lived and not have to change a whit, and you know many people will will cotton to that in a hurry. Uh, one argument is well it's going to push that water elsewhere. Well, I'm thinking it's got the whole damn ocean to push it to. Really? I mean, what's the problem? I mean, it well, the three panelists, be careful to speak oh, into the microphone. Yeah. Yes. Here, you, you can actually hold them if you like. I think you can pull or whatever you like. But. Yeah. I mean, the, the idea of one solution solving this huge problem is, is a bit short-sighted. It's, oh, sorry. Microphone. The idea of, be of one large so one solution mind. solving this problem for this area and thinking that it would solve the problem for everybody else is in, it's a long-term solution in that it costs a lot and the, the uh, impacts and, and getting it actually built would would be a long-term solution, but in the end, it doesn't actually address the cultural needs and the, the idea of this paradigm shift that Chris was mentioning of, of, you know, we need to think about how to let water in and live with the water and think differently about um, our urban fabric and how it's functioning today. I mean, we can't continue to just live on the coast, on the coast, on the coast and not address this problem and just think that we can build walls and expect it to, to go away the next day. Okay. Um, Okay, there's a beginning argument, but this yeah. argument may, may yet have to be had at some point after it's, some... And it's happening now. I mean, in All New over York the City, place. In New York, we've in, heard tons about yeah. walls and berms. Yeah. And, um, I'm so glad the three of you are here tonight. Nina, I'm so glad you made it from Florida in spite of all the weather. That's really <laughs> terrific. We're going to look at things around the entire world, and we're going to relate them uh, fully to Boston as well. Um, the, the, as I understand, and Renee has it right in her opening piece in this wonderful edition, if you haven't re read it, of... Uh, of the magazine, really check it out. But you know, we had the idea of resistance, which we're kind of talking about here. Build a wall. The idea of retreat. Worcester is the new Boston. Uh, and now <laughs> you're all <laughs> <laughs> Worcester strong. Uh, and now you're all here as uh, acolytes of resilience, and that means all kinds of things. And for each of you, your emphasis is something a little bit different. Where, wherever you've worked in the world and in the United States, and I'd like to just get your opening thoughts on. First of all, what are we facing? Do you, do you, are you going with the presumption of, I don't know, something around six feet, give or take what, in the next what? And on the basis of that, what, what's your basic approach, whether it's Boston or around the world? Hubert, let, if we may start with you. Well, I, you know, not being a climate scientist, one ha just has to accept what the most reliable scientists are telling us, and more than 95% of scientists are agreed on a range of uh, probabilities. Uh, somewhere between 30 inches and 60 inches have been revised upwards to uh, between 3 feet and 6 feet of rise uh, uh, by the year 2100. So I am, you know, just as I'm prepared to get on an air...
that assumption as being a reasonable, a reason. I think you know there are a couple of points that have is is the mic straight into the mics. Was that not working? Oh, pull that out, okay. Nina. All right, just, you can pull it right out. Just strong arm it. Good. Okay, just a, a couple of points. Chris mentioned that nobody in their right mind would uh, would design for one in a thousand years. That's a 0.1% probability of something happening. Well, in fact, the Dutch designed to 0.01%, a one in 10,000 year probability of something on their most strategic and most, uh, as it were, uh, critical uh, facilities. So, uh, and the Dutch are, I think, preeminently characterized by being in their right mind, except for some of their so social issues. <laughs> I was there for Gay Pride Day in Amsterdam this summer. Wow. <laughs> right. Socially, their mind is uh, multifarious. Uh, right, right, right. Some of those chaps were yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fo focus, focus. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I don't mean I went for Gay Pride Day, <laughs> but I was there. Sorry. Okay, there was my point water. was... <laughs> well contained. Yeah. Um, and the second, second issue that has come on, which Nina alluded to, which is, you know, possibly abandoning the, the coast. Well, the fact is that historically, I mean, let's take Boston for starters. Boston is built on the coast for economic reasons. I mean, we were a port uh, linking us back to Europe for trade. And that is 400 years of history that one would abandon and take Boston as a paradigm. But there are so many cities all around the world and anything called Exeter or Aix-en-Provence or Aachen demonstrate that most cities are founded on their water for either for drinking or for uh, trade. So to abandon the culture of cities in this radical way is something that one has to sort of fold into the design issue. I think we'll get easy assent to that in this room. Nina, what's your starting point conceptually here? Well, I, what Hubert said about not being a climate scientist, and as a designer, um, our job is to solve problems, and it's inherently an optimistic view of the world to solve, and that's what wakes me up in the morning, every morning, and I'm excited to go to work, and I'm sure many of us are in, in that same way. And this climate change being one of the biggest problems that's impacting us as designers and, and others, um, there's this opportunity to really rethink you know, uh, we've been living on the water for years. We've also been building here in Boston. 50% of downtown is on fill. We've been doing it over the years without any consequence thus far. Um, now we're feeling the consequences. And as urban designers and myself as a landscape architect, we have to start thinking about our actions and how, they're, how they've been impacting us. But, you know, we have this opportunity to change that and to, to think differently and design differently. And I think that's really exciting. There's so many proposals out there that are coming up every day for New Jersey, the coast of New Jersey, for New York, um, and they're inspiring, and it's all about living with water. Um, and that's the multifunctional response that I think has the strongest resiliency when you, when you look at how people have been living with water for years in cities and how we can do so in the future. Chris, your big opening approach here. Uh, mine is that water needs space in the city. I think the climate data is very clear. Um, I think for the last couple of centuries, as we've built cities, um, oceans, wetlands, rivers, lakes have been engineered um, so that the footprint of water in the city is less and less and less. It's pushed away, it's put underground, it's erased entirely. But the water doesn't go away. Um, the water somehow is still there. It still wants to be there. If you look at the maps, the old maps of Boston, you see this. Um, I grew up in New Bedford. Unacceptable, the old maps of Boston. <laughs> I mean, if you put water back where it was. Well, no, no, that then yeah. becomes the design challenge, right? It, it's, it's not an anti-urban solution. It's just understanding that water needs a place in the city. It, some place. It, some place in the city, and those, and, and so that, that, that you design or redesign the urban fabric to accommodate water in the city when it needs to be there, I think is the departure point for a lot of the ways that we think about um, uh, and work and teach. Hubert, does that mean Venice? Well, Boston. Yes. <laughs> uh, Microphone uh, discipline, ladies uh, and gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> Microphone well, discipline. Uh, Boston slowly sinking into the sea. I, that would not be my. Uh, uh, I mean, my canals instead of. Uh, yes. Uh, you well, know. Boston uh, can actually quite well be tr contrasted with Amsterdam in a sort of corresponding period of 400 years, whereas Amsterdam has canalized its water. 
um, so that it is known as a city, a northern city on the water and where water is a major landscape feature, Boston has been in 400 years of denial about its water. Mm. And you, you see on the maps here that um, all that uh, made land, as Nancy Seasholes puts it, um, is really in denial of its natural topography. Um, so, canalized like Amsterdam? Let's think about what this means. The most important thing we can do here tonight is talk about solutions out of these kind of perspectives. You began, Hubert, with critical infrastructure. I mean, we saw what happened in New York. Yeah. We saw the images of water pouring into the subways. We saw hospitals without power systems. Uh, you're all, you've already worked on uh, a critical infrastructure in Charlestown. Can you tell us something about that? Uh, yes, well, I think, you know, it's. Uh, in architectural circles, this has been fairly well rehearsed, you know, so what we've done is we've pushed the building up as far as we could get it, which put into, into a reasonably safe zone, projecting over the next 80 or 90 years. And just in case we weren't in a safe zone, we put all the mechanical and electrical features up on uh, um, up on the roof. Could you describe the building its function? I think half our crowd are not okay. necessarily architects. Uh, the Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital is a 132-bed hospital uh, built new in Charlestown Navy Yard, just on this site here on the Little Mystic Channel. Um, and it was uh, a brownfield site, um, heavily toxic and had to be remediated. And why would one build on such a place? Uh, because a, a hospital, I and mean, it was the view of everybody involved in the design team and the, our high command in partners, um, that a hospital is an urban institution and has to remain urban. It would have been far easier to build on high ground somewhere out in the suburbs, but then you're generating traffic, you're far away from your constituents, you're not creating jobs in the city, etc. So this was a chance to contribute to that uh, remaking of the urban fabric. So given those problems of the projected sea level rise, I mean, you know, the hard bit was just to come up with the question. The easy bit was to sort of figure out, okay, what are the common sense solutions? Jack it up a little bit, put, this, put all the uh, sensitive stuff up on the roof, get all the patient critical programs off of the ground floor, um, the, the one thing that remains actually is the kitchen, but we have, by regulation, have to have four days of uh, edible food supply on the premises anyway. Um, and then to have, learning from Hurricane Katrina, one of the critical things at Memorial Hospital was that people were suffocating in the heat, in, and hurricanes typically happen in the hot weather. People were suffocating for just because they could not open the windows and the air conditioning had broken down. And so we actually negotiated not only with the code enforcers, but with our own engineers uh, to be able to open all, win all patient windows uh, in the event of an emergency. They can be keyed open. The public spaces like the gym and the cafeteria and the swimming pool actually have operable windows at any time of year. Um, so these were all common sense things. And we've introduced a green roof so that water runoff is not as fast as it would be if it were a hard roof, and so on. However, this, you know, as smart as we think we are, and as great as we think this building is, and we are self-congratulatory about it, uh, it is not good enough. Um, we you didn't we jack it up high enough, or what? No. We are relying on an infrastructure, which is incredibly Everything vulnerable. Around know. it. So, just for instance, clinical staff getting to and from work um, are, you know, it's a very vulnerable, it's the weakest link. And then we have electricity, which we've dealt with to a certain extent with emergency generators and with a cogeneration plant, which deals with, I think it's 25% of the power. Somebody might be able to correct me in here from Perkins and Will. Um, so we've taken all sorts of precautionary measures, but it's not foolproof because it is not in, as, as Chris was saying, it is not a holistic solution. We have to think beyond our own boundaries in order to provide a really safe environment. Uh, so many questions come off that, but Chris, I want to bring you in. We're going to let the water come in, mm -hmm. but you don't want it to just go willy-nilly because if you do, it's going to flood out everything. It's going to short everything out. It's going to stop transportation. Got one nice hospital. Lord knows what it would cost to jack everything up or 
Uh, if you bring water in, what examples of that are, are there of that being a success around the world? And what might that mean in Boston? Sure. Um, I think there are a number of examples where the edges of a coast have been radically re-engineered and redesigned so that water, um, as water levels are rising, whether that's a river or a lake or an ocean, um, water has some place to go. Water becomes a kind of actant, actor uh, within the space. Um, rather than having fully bulkheaded walls, you have lower areas, terraced areas, so that people can still inhabit that space even when the water's high. What's nice about solutions that, that, that do that, that bring the water in, is people become much more aware of the dynamic of the environment, the fact that um, the, the, the environment is having an impact on us, and just simply that realization that uh, the environment is changing, the climate is changing, because they can see it as they're walking to work, as they're having lunch, they can see the higher tide, I think is a good first step to changing um, public perception. Do, does this mean waiting are. for the water to rise, or do you change it right now by going no, out and putting in some <coughs> big part of, water? Part of it's to re-engineer the entire edge now. of the coast. Now. Um, you can do that even uh, along the coastline in, in Boston. There are still sites available uh, along the waterfront where you can lower the grade, allow high water in, give it a place to be, but design those as open spaces that are allowed to flood. You can do that with streets as well. You could refigure all of the innovation district, the seaport. Is this like the big uh, dry gullies in L.A. that were... No, guys smoke cigarettes until the, <coughs> until the water? No, in fact, that's a single-use infrastructure. And I think um, somebody's already made the point that what we want to look at are, are solutions that are multifunctional, that allow for public access, that improve the quality of the environment by cleaning air, by cleaning water, um, and also deal functionally with uh, the flood at hand. Um, and so uh, the Changi Chung River that was uh, mentioned up front. This is in Seoul. This it was their big Seoul elevated Korea. highway. I exactly know it right. very well. Yeah. It was in riots there when Kim Jong Sang came home from Boston. Right. Uh, right. Kim Dae Jung. Yep. And now it's gone. And now it's gone. And it's, uh, but they've got water there all the time, not just when the big flood comes, right? No, in fact, I, isn't in, it a, in, it's in it's fact, a, they made an effort to bring more water in, to take the water that was coming out of the subway tunnels and rather than just putting in pipes, to actually put it into the new river system a, to be clean, but B, to have a supply of water but there. But they took the elevated highway down. They, they dug out the old river that they had paved away. over. They took right. it away. Yep. And now there is a, a, a depth there yep. Yep. Uh, where the old river was before. And they, w they pump water. There's water in it all, all the time, and it gets higher. And it gets higher. It floods. It's, a, it's purely a flood channel at high water. And otherwise, it's one of the most attractive new and popular new open spaces in Seoul. Do we People have enough places, Nina, in Boston? Forgive me, it's my radio habit. Um, <laughs> do we have enough areas in Boston that we could, you know, just blast open and let the water in without running into the Chamber of Commerce laying, you know, I'll die first across the tracks? Uh, not to mention everybody else who lives in... I, do we... Right. Can we begin to do that? When, if you say, okay, three foot rise or six foot rise, that's what that means in terms of water pressure on our waterfront. If we want to let that in and control where it goes, do we have enough real estate that we could convert to duck ponds uh, to do that? I think there is real estate currently, and as we move forward, there would need to be some sort of phasing and planning involved to create more space and more opportunities for that. Um, that would involve um, city council and all the partners and the community groups and government agencies um, as a collaborative process to make that happen. Uh, and that's what you're seeing in New York. That's what you're seeing uh, as part of the Rebuild by Design project that Sasaki were working on. It's so, there's so many stakeholders that are part of that. Um, and, and that's what you see in towns in, in the Midwest that are dealing with river flooding. It's nonprofit agencies. It's everybody coming together with the government, with the cities. There are at times buyouts happening. So people are moving out of those areas. Um, but then what's 
coming in, in place are multifunctional green spaces that can flood occasionally, but then also serve as these wonderful public amenities for, um, for the just day to day that Chris was mentioning. Um, and so Boston is it, is it being a palatable yes, I, map that emerges I, because I, I your answer so. just been, now is yeah. beautiful. But as a politician, yes, I, I don't totally buy it. Understand. My yeah, antenna yeah, are yeah, out yeah. to the moon yeah. and I'm there thinking are, this is going to kill so many of my constituents. And, I and think you're just talking architect the, talk and people challenge. are going to be up in arms and going to have riots. Yeah, yeah. That's the challenge. No, but tell me, <laughs> is it going to gut the Boston we love to bring in the water? No, that you guys I think we would create an even better Boston. And we would. Yeah, what's that mean? You're a water. You're a water person, right? Yeah, I'm on the water camp here. Um, yeah, but well, we, we spent uh, how many hundred years filling this in? How much of it are we going to have to give back? I, uh, 10 percent? I'm not sure what the percentage is, but I know that 25 percent of Boston would flood in the um, six foot sea level rise scenario. So we should be looking and we poison. should be we Look. should be proactive because if we don't do anything. OK, then that, that's good. And and does that mean 25 percent has to be given up for water or you can if you control it, you can. Absorb the water exactly. in five percent. No, you, you, there are a lot of ways to do it in in ingenious ways that you don't need twenty five percent. I mean, you brought up the Chamber of Commerce. My answer back to the Chamber of Commerce is this is going to improve your your property values. Right. Yeah. These kinds I'm of buying interventions. In Boston yeah, strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. This is going to uh, improve your um, property value. I mean, imagine, for instance, if the Big Dig had been designed or engineered um, for flooding when the flood occurred. Right? Yeah. That's a big tunnel. That's a big holding tank. I You're mean, a little late, dude. That, well, no, I know. I'm a little <laughs> late. But imagine if it had been. I mean, what you well, in saw. Well, a way it is, right? Because that's what will happen. It is, but it's not designed to withstand that. And that's oh. what happened with the subways in New York. Um, there was an interesting story on the East River in New York during Sandy. There were two power plants, one in Brooklyn, one in, in Manhattan. Um, and everybody knew the storm was coming. Everybody knew the flood was coming. In Brooklyn, they shut down the power plant. Mm -hmm. In Manhattan, they kept the power plant running. Bro Brooklyn, they said, well, no, no, let's shut it down, prevent any damage. Uh, people in Brooklyn lost power for two to three or four hours. People in Manhattan, as you know, lost power for days because as, th as the water flooded an operating system, it then destroyed the equipment that was there. And so that's a that's and and that's a thousand year flood, right? So that's that's an example where you don't have to design; you just live with the inconvenience for that period of time, that short period of time. Let the thing go by and reboot after that. I think well, there are, are you lessons. saying that Manha even Manhattan's answer was not bad in a thousand year flood scenario. No, actually, Brooklyn's Brooklyn's, Brooklyn's answer was not bad. Was not bad. Simply yeah. shut that critical infrastructure down. Um, and reboot after the storm went away. Manhattan couldn't reboot because the, the water had damaged all the electrical equipment. H how much can we do uh, away from the city, uh, Nina? I mean, we're hearing, you mentioned New Jersey and mm -hmm. they're talking about oyster yeah. beds in the Pacific yeah. River. Yeah. I'm just not feeling oyster beds anywhere stopping this. Well, uh, it's, yeah. more oyster beds in Wellfleet, less flooding uh, I, in Boston. I don't. The the assumption, and there's been data to show that oyster beds and and material in the water would attenuate wave and I storm love oyster surge. Beds. I love oysters. And of course, the they provide the better, oysters but, for food. Yes. But is that really? Uh, it would be. It would in order. It wouldn't be stopping sea level rise, but mm -hmm. it would help attenuate wave action in the case of a storm surge. So those are two different things. Storm surge obviously is happening overnight in the case of a hurricane. Mm -hmm. An immediate emergency response situation it would help buffer some of the waves but for sea level rise and long-term um, you know rising of the tides it would not help keep water at bay however it would extend and soften an edge and make a more articulated crenulated edge that would provide um, a more flexible um, situation you know How currently you we have the edge of Rose Wharf well, I mean, you can extend into the water. You could also with um, what like with floating wetlands, with oyster be beds. There are engineered, bioengineered solutions where you create structures that then, um, like, add you put in place habitat and fish and creatures come. Would to that it be important even in the inside Boston definitely. Harbor? Definitely, definitely. I mean, even inside, F even in even the downtown. Inside. And I think the concern though is with shipping channels and the yeah. economic driver of Conley Terminal. Well, what I mean is, at, 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 let's say at Rose Wharf, yeah, the harbor is only so wide. Yes, it is. is. So is there enough real estate down there for shipping channels and oyster beds and that's seaweed? That's the tightest constraint in there. That's uh -huh. the tightest constraint. But um, you can, and also there are lower, flatter areas that used to be tidal marshes all within the Boston area. Um, and a lot of them are in here and up above around the airport. And so those are already low-lying areas that are pretty much primed for this kind of um, 
you know, re-softening and tidal marshland reconstruction that would help uh, in the future? But I think I think we need to be careful. Um, I think there are great examples from around the world, and, yes. and, and oysters are, are really hot right now. <laughs> um, uh, and we can point to examples in Holland, uh, in New York, um, in Seoul, uh, with strategies that have been developed uh, for those places to deal with flood. I think the situation in each of these places is quite different. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the mouth of New York Harbor is configured much differently than the mouth of Boston Harbor. And so it, it's important to look at these precedents from around the world to say, look, there are, there are a great array of examples for how people can deal with flooding. And so what lessons would you that. point to for this City well, on a hill. that's where you really need to get into the specific science and engineering of what is happening with the water, what are the expected forces and effects as they play out in this particular area, and then develop specific design and engineering solutions. We had a big report a year ago. All of us looked at the map yeah. and gaped at where the water would come. Right. It had a lot of detail. Enough right. detail to begin doing this? Do we know what we need to know to get going? The maps are good because it tells you a little bit of where the vulnerable, well, it very clearly tells you where the vulnerable places are, right? Um, what it doesn't tell you is where it's best to act in order to alleviate some of the concerns. Some of where you act is precisely within those shaded areas that will flood. But as Nina's suggesting, this is a much more regional, um, larger scale set of effects that we're dealing with. And you can start to imagine a whole series of interventions out into the harbor that also um, uh, deal with attenuating waves and, and other solutions. So by regional, you don't mean that region, that big, you mean the harbor region. Well, I mean, uh, I, yeah, I mean, the harbor and just beyond the harbor. We're not talking Salem and New Bedford. No, I think you have, have their own whole, issues. They have their own issues. You'd have a whole set of different dynamics at work in each of those. You places. might be. Um, so I, I was hoping that it would get back up to this scale because it's not that I disagree with anything that Chris and Nina are saying, but I do strongly believe that it's a question of both and, and you've got to build, and the, the magnitude of the problem actually requires a magnitude of response and a multitude of responses. Now, we, we've sort of gone down a channel, if I may use the word, yes of discussing purely physical things. Um, a couple of things that I have learned from talking with hospital administrators um, who had to deal with Hurricane Sandy in the New York area. First is in Saint, the St. Barnabas Hospital System in New Jersey uh, found that, you know, that actually their hospitals were reasonably resilient and you know, they had their problems, etc. But 65% of their staff lived in 100-year flood areas. They had not appreciated this Prior to this, the which slide meant we saw far Rockaway, whatever it was, their nurses right. may have lived there. They the, were coming in, so they were really. I mean, the staff were very anxious about their own families, yeah. you know, and They're whether they were going to survive. The other th uh, very interesting anecdote, and I hadn't it puts together two different, entirely different conversations, was um, three hospitals uh, right in the middle of New York, um, a private hospital whose name I can't remember. Then there was NYU Langone, and then there was the Bellevue Hospital. The private hospital took, made the strategy of getting everybody out and transferring them to other private hospitals in the New York area into a safe, safe haven. And NYU Langone decided uh, a little bit of one, uh, putting their patients elsewhere, and um, during the course of the hurricane, dealing with the other uh, patients. And then the last, Bellevue, could not transfer its patients anywhere because nobody would take basically patients who are not paying. And this doctor's point, who is a senior person, and so we could talk about where their generators were or where their electrical equipment was or whether something was switched off or switched on, etc., and where their staff were. But he said, we cannot be a resilient hospital until we have universal health care. Wow. So there's a uh, kind of social... Yeah. cultural, commercial accommodation That's right. that has to go along with everything yeah. else. And uh, you, as the politician... Would be in 2026. 20, yes. Uh, you know, as, a, as, a, as, a rep uh, as you're representing floods. a Republican member of Congress with your aggressive questioning here about science and so on, 40% of your cohort 
yes. actually deny uh, evolution. Never mind climate change. Listen, I'm not playing that guy anymore, okay? <laughs> but I'm trying to keep this positive. That's Nina gets guy. up with hope in her. <laughs> <laughs> well, but this is important because all of this is costly, it's disruptive, it's... Uh, it's if jobs. You if you don't believe, it's but if you it's don't believe, it could be jobs. It could it's be. jobs. Well, it, y yes, it could be jobs. But people have been saying that, you know, for Paul Krugman's been saying that for how many years now, and we never did that. We won't necessarily do it for this either. H here's a question: if if we could sit back and be all wise, we accept the science. We're not denying. Well, let's just accept evolution while we're at it and be done with all that. <laughs> we accept the science. We're, we want to be wise. We want to be. We, want, we don't want to be contemporary Americans. We want to be wiser than that. We want to be Dutch for a minute. Um, those chaps were incredible. Uh, is, the, is the most reasonable way to go at a solution for Boston, maybe for anywhere, but specifically for Boston, step by step, accretive, or one big go? Can you sort of do this a little bit at a time, or do you have to sit back? You know, I mean, the topography is perfectly known. Hmm. The future is pretty well known. It's not uh, a mystery box, right? We can see what's coming. So do you sit back, size it all up, and say, here are the infrastructure changes that we should make, and some of them are going to be really big, and, or, or do you just begin to go at it? You do the uh, Spalding Rehab, and then you do this place, you do that place. You got resistance from a lot of people, because why should I do it? spend the money? They didn't spend the money. One big go or accretive? It's all of the above. I mean, you've got to be doing those things simultaneously. There's no time to waste. What's great about the report that the Boston Harbor Association produced is all of a sudden it puts very clear in front of everybody what the threat is. If you're a landowner, if you're a developer and you have a project and you're on the waterfront, you can act now to design that waterfront, to design that building in a way to accommodate flood, to deal with the, the increasing flood tide. If you're a person working for the city or for the state who wants to take on a bigger regional project, you can start to put in place the wheels to do those studies right now. I think it's got to come uh, at multiple scales, um, and it's got to come in multiple formats. And I think that all of us have a role in, in doing it, whether we're a policymaker, whether we're a designer or an engineer, or whether we're demanding it as a member of the public. In Seoul, just to take an example, with the yeah. Chongi Chung River, it was a river, then it turned into an elevated expressway, they took it back to a river. Yeah. There were lots of businesses along that expressway, lots of things got turned upside down yep. with this bringing right. back the water. That's right. How did they handle it? How did they? Did they say, look, if you tear this building down, you can have a new waterfront building on the new river we're putting in, or here's a pot of cash, go away. How, how did they work with the commercial interests, mm -hmm. the property interests mm -hmm. uh, on there to get their buy-in? Well, there's, a, there's always a tension between people who are there making a living, doing just fine. In, in this case, a lot of um, auto body shops, um, light industrial kinds of uses were situated along the highway because it was not very valuable land. Yeah, okay. Once the highway went away, all of a sudden it became very valuable. So land. easy because they were creating value. They were creating value. They probably value. didn't even tell them what no, they were no, going to no. do. Just That's kicked right. them out and took it you for themselves. The, the open space and infrastructure initiative essentially created value. It created a market that wasn't there. Right. And then the market forces took over, and one by one, you see a great transformation all the way along that. What happens if you have to move international place? You ain't going to move international place. Well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you have to move valuable. The financial district is not very high, is it? It's, it's not, but if you look at, it's really the, the fringes of the financial district that we're talking about, yeah? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and some some areas here. That but, would be the waterfront. That's but what that's we that's pricing. where the solution that you would use out at the airport near um, Castle Island isn't the solution that you would use right downtown. That's where you have to take a nuanced approach to: Are there some places where you might build up a little bit? Are there places where? you redesign, rework the streets and the ground floors to allow for flooding. I, I heard one anecdote um, about a hotel downtown that as they were undergoing renovation, they 
uh, redesigned their first floor, it still had the kind of street life that's important to support active social life. It had coffee carts, retail, all that, those sorts of things. But those things could be quickly evacuated in the, in the event of a flood. And so it was a redesign of the thing that was there. Um, uh, that's interesting. In, in all of this, uh, Nina, should we be thinking of this in terms of permanent everyday change or even in the worst case scenario, six foot rise, this is still something that's only be going to be manifest once every 10, 15 years. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a term no regrets policy, so you're designing with no regrets. So you design for the day-to-day -day, um, where you allow it to function uh, normally, but then in the case, if there was that storm that could happen, but maybe it doesn't, but it could happen, um, you allow the water to come in and you provide space for that water to be and you have sacrificial first floors that you could evacuate out and allow it to flood. But on a day-to-day, -day, you have these beautiful urban spaces that still function normally as they would today with urban life and retail on the bottom floor and, and residential on Real the top. Real full-on right, exactly. retail, they're gonna put yep. like, I don't know, but fancy would, real tail. William Sonoma is going to build out even if it may have a flood every 10 years? Or is it yeah, going mean, to be all push carts on the first I mean, floor? you could design it with tile floor as opposed to carpet or, you know, not have your uh, critical um, m mechanical systems but on the first floor. But retail as we know it now, yeah. you think we'll stay on a ground floor in the Rose Wharf Hotel lobby? I, I think so, but it would be designed differently and the material would be differently, different. Yeah, okay. I think yeah. that's totally possible. So, for instance, the RIBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects, uh, uh, has some design guidelines for how to build in flood-prone areas. And one of the uh, sort of sacrificial lambs is retail on the ground floor. You know, you can dispense with that. But residential is obviously much more critical. And so you want to lift that above ground floor. So they have some, you know, there's some fairly complex charts, but they look at what is critical, what is critical for life safety in particular, and what is not so critical, and make their priorities on Hubert, that basis. Do you think in the year 2090, mm. um, premier Boston retail will all be on what we, will be one floor up from the from street level? Yes. It will have, well, it'll all be on elevated walkways, and it'll be like secondary retail at what we now call ground level. Well, so then our design challenge is what do you do on the ground level? Because, you know, for yeah, most of the body shops and, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Right. Like in any third world country. I mean, you have well, to... Well, cars can move. I, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know, but surely there are... I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Push carts. But push ca yeah, push, you, I mean, there are only so many push carts you can accommodate. I'm... <laughs> But, you know, we've, be, we've been talking about Boston, and I think it's right to bring it back to Boston, but if you just move 25 miles from Boston, where the values are not so high, and where you have residential development in river plains, which are prone to flooding, such as in Brockton, you know, which has very low property prices, yeah. and people are flooded out almost on a yearly basis. I mean, so forget the 1%, it's, you know, closer to 50% chance of flooding. And they have been living there for the last, you know, 50, 100 years, etc. So, you know, there's, an, there's a, an alternate question, which is, you know, not international place, which, by the way, is built on Fort Hill, which is high ground. You know, it's, it's actually right on yeah. the edge of the yeah. Shawmut Peninsula there. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you do with low-value buildings with sort of low-income populations? And how do you achieve you know, the, the necessary protection for those people as much as you afford protection for high value, high intensity uh, uses well, in, a, in a dense city. So look into your crystal ball. I mean, people are flooding into Boston now. You know, everybody's selling so their speak. million dollar home in wherever, Sudbury, and, you know, buying a condo in Boston. Uh, not everybody, but there are a lot of people doing it. Mm. By no means everybody, but people who tend to have a lot of influence doing it. Yeah. How do you see the politics of these changes playing out? How do you see this unfolding? Are, are we in this together? There's a talk, plenty of talk about inequality and inequality in Boston and every other big city now. Well, I, I do think that uh, there is growing inequality and I think that that means there'll be growing political inequality. And so for instance, our so-called gateway cities, you know, um, all those industrial cities, Lawrence and Lowell and uh, Springfield, all those cities which actually started on the water because the water was there for motive power, etc., they are going to be left behind unless uh, the state or private enterprise sees value in investing in those cities which are 
nevertheless flood, flood prone. Doesn't doesn't this and turn the turn the uh, cards even more in Boston's favor because people are going to have to put their their chits somewhere, and this is expensive. What we're talking about. Are you, you, are they going to save every city on the Massachusetts coastline? Or are you going to look at the, the big kahuna and save that one? And, you know, the others, it's not as valuable. And, uh... So do you leave it to the market or do you leave it to governance? Who's in office? <laughs> <laughs> right. Or, or no, well, I, maybe no matter who's in, maybe maybe no government can afford to do all of it. And maybe no government can afford to tell Boston no. Well, on behalf of Lawrence. But it goes back to Chris's point, which is, you know, when you're asking, well, what do we do? I think we do make a big plan and we show where the priorities are and where the highest value or the most vulnerable populations are. And we've got a lot of that information, actually. And we plan accordingly. Um, the London plan, for instance, which projects out to 2100, looks at such a long period of time in terms of scenarios. And they take it in, I think it's 20-year 20, 20 increments. Mm. So... They make an assumption for 20 years, and if it's playing out just exactly the way they thought it was, they press on with the 80-year plan. And if it's not as bad as they thought it was, then they sort of ratchet things down a bit and, you know, not right, in bed right. so much. So but they're here's flexible. Where, here's yep. where soft infrastructure um, kind of hits on a couple levels. Soft infrastructure is cheaper than some of the harder infrastructure that's being proposed, and it serves multiple purposes. I mean, letting the water in. Yeah, and, and oyster beds and, yes. and, yeah. and floodable parks and all that. A lot of that is cheaper than if you were to build big dikes and engineer them. But it also serves Or even purposes. just engineer individual buildings. Because yeah, sure. you can channel the water right. where you know it's going to go and it's all right. Right, and it also serves other purposes by having a planted area rather than um, uh, a non-planted area. You're also generally cooling that micro-environment, which if you imagine a thousand of those across the waterfront start to um, help the bigger issue that's, that's behind all this, which is climate change and the impact that humans are having on the environment generally. So the city is not as much of a heat sump as it would have been. Right. That's right. I'm still trying to picture this in Boston. You, you talk about little places along the waterfront, but it seems like it's going to take more than that. It's, it's many, many smaller places. You started out with this idea, put a big dike at the mouth of the Inner Harbor and flood other areas. And I thought that was quite interesting, not for the dike, but the idea that we give over large territories along the coastline to other uses, to other functions. I think there's something in that, that thinking. I didn't mean that against really Hull. Good. I think no. that that flooding and is I, being I also spread don't, over the I whole also world. Don't, I, I also don't think that a soft infrastructure excludes development or excludes people. At Harvard, we're looking at proposals uh, along the coastline of Jamaica Bay in New York, mm -hmm. which actually allows for development within a floodable zone. So you get both the contributions of a piece of soft infrastructure, you get a much more resilient environment, but you also get a development solution that creates revenue um, and brings people there. So I think the idea that you allow people to live safely um, in these places is really quite important. It requires ingenuity, it, it requires invention, and that's where the design community You say a lot of little water spaces would be incorporated. Uh, the big ones interest us, of course. What's the biggest one you would, if, if we really wanted to do this, uh, there would be a lot of little ones. There might have to be some big ones. How big is the biggest, what, what, you know, what's it going to look like? What, what's going to be the big new trench or pond or pool or well, sea? Well, Chris teaches at, at uh, Harvard, so I think that whole sort of ah. bit of bl blue <laughs> stuff <laughs> around MIT. Yeah, they're they're already already over there at Austin, <laughs> right? Forget science. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, uh, I don't know. How big? Is, is there going to be big as any of that? I mean, give it all to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But Hello. but if you look at Fort Point Channel and yeah. you look at the Reserve Channel, you could you could actually go back into what is now we now refer to as the South Bay. Yeah. Yep. Right. So, oh well, that seems you know, very handy. Could we solve the whole thing just by not developing that junkyard? Well, no, by developing well, it in a way I which yes. allows yeah. for a floodable urban fabric that that radically recreates the kind of shopping, parking lots, and all that that's around there, 
and also brings good quality development to those places. That'd be a fantastic recovery Boston, of a waterfront. I mean, as being situated here where we weren't f as impacted uh, by Sandy as New York and other yes. cities, we have this opportunity to be proactive. We could create, one of my students called an architectural, a sea level rise architectural playground where you allocate space for water to come in and then allow architects and designers to come in and really create innovative, cool architectural solutions. It seems solutions almost ready-made, extending the Fort Point. I mean, yeah. there it is. And we, it's were, we were also looking at East Boston. There's a greenway that runs through East Boston, the low point where the water is coming through East Boston at the top there. Okay, yeah, um, and yeah. it's you know perfectly situated right now. There's an old rail line. It's a greenway currently. Um, there are some buildings there, but it, you know it, you could create a whole new environment that could function. Um, Just for scale, if we water. did those two things, yeah. would that be enough? No. 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 <laughs> okay. Okay. We're still screwed. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, we've got a lot to do here. Yeah. Uh, I think we're coming up on question time. Th this is really great. Uh, before we go to the harangues and chastisement of the audience, right. uh, I, 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 I want to thank you. You're really good sports. And thank you. Shall we applaud? Aren't they worthy? <laughs> thank you. Yeah, here, here, have a hand mic. Okay, this is the part where you ask questions um, from the audience, and there are quite a few people here who I know are interested in having something to say, but I wanted to first recognize um, Julie Worms here in the back that I can barely see um, from the Boston Harbor Association, which uh, produced this wonderful report last year. And yes. That slide here, and you had just start by telling me what you, what you emailed me about, um, you, you know, the nor'easter we had just a couple of days ago. Sure. No, I, I um, <laughs> started out as a, a, a vegetable farmer and learned a lot about water on the job. Um, I'm the executive director of the Boston Harbor Association. I was the lead author of the report. And um, since writing this report, I've been watching the tide a little more closely. And in the last 14 months, we've missed 200-year 200 200-year floods and one near 1,000-year flood by a half a tide cycle. So, so Sandy, Nemo, and this last nor'easter, Hercules, um, they all landed on astronomical high tides, which we call wicked high tides in Boston. And, um, and, and the storm surge came at, the, at low tide. So had those storm surges come at high tide, you would have gotten this flooding uh, or, or more three times in the last 14 months. So we're looking at wow. luck today we're looking at this being a twice daily high tide in a, in a century. And I, I think, you know, Tom, when you're talking about, you know, is this going to happen every 15 years, that's more like a... That's uh, a pipe dream? I, I'm, I'm no, that's more like when you're thinking about like an earthquake. This is something that we're going from near misses to absolute certainty over time. The great thing about Boston Harbor, though, is if you look at that map, we've got 34 Boston Harbor Islands. The ones outside Hull and Winthrop, they're taking it for the team. See how skinny they are? Those um, dampen our storm surges. I don't know where to stand. Okay. Um, they're taking it for the team, and they're so dampening storm surges that our 1,000-year storm surge is not much more than a foot more than our 100-year storm surge. We're really looking at sea level rise over time. The problem is that our ancestors knew that, so they built really, really close to high tide. So really when we're talking about five feet above high tide is that map. They understood the storm surge protection of the islands. And Cape Cod and Stellwater Bay. That Bank leaves us Ann. vulnerable to the sea rise itself. Right. So when we're talking about about a third of the city being filled in and being very, very close to high tide, maybe when you talk about the seawall, you're talking about a wall at the foot of the heights, right? that you're talking about a sapphire necklace among these flats where you are living among beautiful meandering below grade water elements and you're starting to try to prevent flooding higher up. Because uh, really well, when we're Where do you mean? Beacon Hill. So Dorchester it is. Heights. Uh, we you know knew that it. You're just going to protect Beacon Hill. <laughs> Dorchester. I mean, the, the irony is not necessarily environmental Oh, you mean all justice. the heights, like the mayor is, uh, yes, Savin Hill and Pope Hill and all Mission the, Hill. All the hills. They're good all the for hills. centuries. But the flats are going to be repeatedly flooded more and more often and, and one day by tidal flooding. So we're really talking about today this being an emergency response. We know how to protect for flooding. 
you know, get your stuff out of your basement if you have your valuable documents, right? It's emergency response today. It's infrastructure change over time. And one century, you know, a few centuries from is now, it is the tenor of this conversation, and I'll take responsibility for the tenor, is it, is it um, appropriate to the challenge, to the risk, to the ideas you're hearing here, as you're listening and ticking all this over in your head, are you thinking, yeah, this all adds up to the right kind of response? Or does it sound too futuristic? No, I think it's really middle-term response. I mean, I don't know that it's necessarily more expensive. Every building rehabs. And you're really talking about the 25 to 50 year capital expenditures saying, okay, when I rehab my building, I'm going to make it really adaptive. In the short term, it's sandbags. In the long term, it's moving your elevator shaft and it's changing your first floor, et cetera. But I think um, one of the things that we're missing, and um, I think some folks did, did mention this, is there are lots of great tactics, but we, it's politically difficult to say who gets flooded and who doesn't. Once Boston decides where's gonna flood, the designers will do a beautiful d redesign. It will be a sapphire necklace to go with our emerald necklace. And it can be a phenomenal city like Amsterdam, like Paris. Right? But it's going to be a change to do that. The difficult thing is basically saying, what's the house going to look like? It's not actually difficult to build it. Right? That, that's probably enough. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to, um, others? Questions? Oh, <laughs> there were 15 hands in this air earlier. <laughs> okay. Oh, Joan. <laughs> I'm sorry. And we, if you'll wait for the mics to answer and your question. Blinded up here. Okay. Sure. My name is Joan Fitzgerald from Northeastern University. Um, hi, Tom. Hi. Just a real quick announcement and, the, and then a question. Um, we have something called the Open Classroom that starts tomorrow night, goes every Wednesday. Our topic is water, challenges of extremes this semester. So if anyone wants more information about it, uh, see me afterwards. We've been talking about is, are these solutions big enough, you know, that we're doing Spalding Hospital, that we do oyster beds, and, you know, that we can't look at specific places. I'm sure all three of you are familiar with Hamburg's Hafen City. Um, and this is an area that is expanding downtown Hamburg by, I think, doubling it. And they're doing things like raising it eight meters, then putting parking garages underneath and essentially using them as cisterns if they need to in that. And when I go there and see that kind of thing, I wonder what are the political, economic, and kind of geological issues that, that we can't do something like that, say, at the Innovation District and other areas as a, as a type of solution for Boston. You are on to my favorite subject. Oh, good. Um, since the 1980s, when the central artery uh, project was really getting underway and the planning was more or less fixed, and it started in 19 the construction started in 1989, the big idea of I-90 was to link Logan Airport with the rest of the country, um, and south the the potential for South Boston, roughly a thousand acres by some measurements, 700 acres possible by other counts, almost exactly equaled the uh, land uh, in a, a city, or what, just uh, Stockholm, just outside of Stockholm, Hammarby Sjöstad. Oh, yeah. Now, they developed a city for 35,000 people, which is not only uh, carbon net zero, but it's also a resilient city. And we did not have the planning mechanisms in place to have such, take such a bold measure. I mean, it's topographically very similar, an old harbor being converted to a fresh new use. And it, uh, frankly, it's a generational disaster. And I apologize to anybody in the room who was involved in it, but we're all the enmeshed dist in the innovation the district, yeah. the seaport district. Yeah. It, it looks it like it on the map. It's like, are you kidding me? Yeah. I mean, just hanging banners out saying this is an innovation district is a mockery, <laughs> frankly. You mean it's a generational disaster because it will flood? It, it will <laughs> flood? It. Yeah. I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, to this question? Yeah, I, I think being in the seat as a designer and not being at the 
government level of making these large decisions. Like Julie said, once Boston decides where the water wants to be or if they want to raise the city, and that's at a regional scale, that's a, a large issue that has to be played out politically before we can do our job coming in and designing. But as designers and having the skills and the abilities to visualize those solutions for Boston, it's on us to provide options for the city. Um, and so I think there's an opportunity where if, if that's something that Boston wants to do and is, is looking at that as an option, we could provide that and visualize it for them and show them how it would work and, and make the graphics and the construction documents to, to show that it could work. Um, but it, it's definitely something at a higher level than, than just designers. But us being part of that conversation in the future is, I mean, that's the biggest, I think, opportunity for design right now and, and being part of that conversation and collaborating and, and, and taking part. Well, you know, I don't know if there's anybody from the state here, but there is somebody who's sitting here. And I just, um, Lee Bamberger from the um, city's environmental uh, department, um, you know, we heard about a London plan, we heard about some New York plans, and, you know, I'm a journalist, I, I read papers, I don't see a whole lot about a Boston plan. Um, is there, why not? You know, is there a plan that's, that's in, in the uh, developmental stages? Explain it for us. And uh, to what extent are you involving uh, the design community? Absolutely. Um, so my name is Leah Bamberg. I'm with the Environment and Energy Services. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, Environment and Energy Services with the City of Boston. And first of all, I just want to thank the panelists here. Thank the VSA, Renee, Tom. And most importantly, thank everyone here for coming and being a part of this conversation. Um, it is very timely. Um, you know, Julie mentioned our near misses, Hurricane Sandy, Nemo, and Hercules. Um, sounds like some sort of comic <laughs> strip or something. Um, but, you know, this is a, and, and the city has taken action. We've done a lot. We've made a lot of progress in the past uh, year alone. And um, looking at both our own vulnerabilities from the city, we have a new report out that explores those issues. And also looking at the community, how we can communicate those issues, what type of building code policies can we examine, what are, our, what are the tools that we have as a city to prepare. You know, we do have um, certain restraints, restraints in that area. We are looking to work closely with the state to make sure our infrastructure uh, that is critical to the city, including the MBTA, the airport, a lot of things that are, in fact, outside of the city's control, but are ab absolutely critical to the resilience of the city. Um, so as uh, Renee alluded to the, the planning process, um, my, my question for the panelists is actually what, and for the audience, I mean, what do you want to see from the city, how can we move this conversation forward into actually talking about, um, you know, we're hearing about all these great solutions, soft, hard, oysters, um, you know, canals, but what does this look like for Boston and how do we really start to, um, to, to, you know, look at the map and say, well, if we do this here and this can go here and, and how do we start to um, apply this to Boston? Um, and then I also just want to make you all aware, I mean, the, the city is updating its climate action plan, and a major component of, component of that is climate preparedness. And we really are looking to engage designers and other uh, members of the community, stakeholders, business organizations, the, all of the city of Boston, and even beyond those who work in the city, uh, to participate in this conversation and help us find these solutions. Uh, we have a online engagement website, engage.greenovateboston.org, where we'll be collecting ideas and uh, getting input um, to have this conversation. And like I said, we're going to be focusing on climate preparedness, and we're also hope to kickstart the conversation on long-term solutions. Because right now, we've been focusing on, you know, the storm that's going to happen next August. You know, but, but we're going to shift that conversation and get it started on the long-term solutions. Renee, could I put that question to all, all the yeah, panelists absolutely. in terms of what you see in the U.S. and around the world? Okay, he, he, Boston's represented right here's the city. It's going to take more than the city. Institutionally, what have you seen as the most effective kind of way to get a grip on this and act? What have you seen in other locales, other cities, other nations? I mean, you've, you've first got to have a, a really robust public dialogue. I'm, I'm glad that Leah and Nancy were here tonight. Um, so often when we talk about these issues, um, we're in environments where there are only designers or only engineers or only one group. 
And what's nice tonight is that we have um, a few people from the city. I'd love to see more people from the city, from the MD MBTA, from Massport, to engage in this dialogue. I know there are designers and engineers in the room. I know there's public in the room. I know that there are representatives of nonprofits in the room. But this isn't a solution that any one sector can solve on its own. It's one that really requires fully engaged dialogue starting now. And I think the more opportunities that we have to continue this conversation in different ways and to begin to push for um, good design solutions, uh, the better off we're going to be. What, wait a minute. That's great. I mean, and this is That's awesome. Great. But that, that is essential, and it's a very important part of what's happening here tonight. But give us a little more, because we've got to get going here. In, look at Seoul. How did they do it? Was it a national directive? It's the capital. Did that make, was it a, what we'd call a federal project? Did they just come in, eminent domain, blow it out? Did they somehow, or, you know, how did they approach putting yeah. a river back to the middle of the no, capital? No, no. For them, it was a city initiative. It was, it was big government, and, and they, were, they were putting the, the, the project through. Hell be damned. Um, in this environment, we have to operate different, differently. It's the same issue with, with Holland. We can't possibly work in the same way that Holland works, our government's different. They learned over centuries that they had to yeah, do this. Yeah, and they're also the size of Rhode Island relative to the United States. That's pretty small. So, Rhode Island so is a paradise, much like <laughs> It is. Um, but I think that... Uh, <laughs> no. I mean, for me, it, it, y y you've got y y to look for opportunities for the public and the private and nonprofits to start on, on their own and in tandem to develop solutions moving forward. I think every developer, every property owner who owns land along the waterfront or who owns land within this map flood zone has an ability on their own to develop a series of site-specific initiatives to address this. But I also think government has a big role here um, to, to really get this issue out in front to make sure that every municipal harbor plan, every environmental plan, every regional study about transfer, transportation includes a significant component of study on this issue. Weirdly, I would think once you've got commercial interests really plugged into this, understanding a future and on board, th they could actually be very strong proponents because they have a lot to lose here. Yeah. Nina, what have you seen in, in other locales? What's well, the institutional response that's most effective? The one example, and I, I mentioned it earlier, Rebuild by Design, which was a design competition federally funded by HUD, the U.S. Housing and Urban Development Department within the government. It was a directive from Obama for the Hurricane Sandy Recovery Task Force. Um, and it's innovation through collaboration at its best, and it's funded by the federal government. And it's What's I mean, it doing? We Where are, is it? Right, so You're on this panel, we're right? One or? team, Sasaki, we're teamed with Arup, who um, on that side it's coastal engineers and transportation engineers, and then Rutgers University as um, an academic component to it, which is just an interesting um, partnership in and of itself with engineers, designers, and the academic ecologists and sociologists. Um, but uh, basically it's a design competition. We were one of 10 teams selected to look at communities affected by Hurricane Sandy. Um, we took a stab at the New Jersey shore. Um, other uh, teams are looking at um, New, uh, New York itself and more m urban metropolises. Um, and uh, all the teams have been given a phase to look uh, into researching the effects of Hurricane Sandy on these areas and then coming up with design opportunities to address these problems. Each team came up with three to five design opportunities. They've picked uh, 10, one each for every team, um, and now we're in a phase where we're coming up with conceptual plans for these projects, and they're slated to be funded and implemented in the next year. Um, and we're working currently with communities, Asbury Park, Keensburg, um, and uh, Tom's River area in New Jersey, uh, collaborating directly with the state government, the counties, the towns themselves. And with um, all these together, yeah. is this, are these model projects, or are yes, these a full they're, solution they're, to the they are prototypical. Sandy Vulnerable? So the idea was regional strategies um, as an overarching um, idea for each of these areas, but then actually getting into on the ground in these specific towns and designing solutions that would be able to be replicated across the country. And so when we are looking at New Jersey, we're looking at small beach communities, um, and beaches obviously are happening all, all around the world. Uh, it's a cultural icon. We all gravitate to beaches and coasts. And um, we're creating strategies to really diversify beach economy and ecology and culture. 
uh, and, and create I mean, a... I mean, forgive me if this is already out there, but yeah. if, if you had a competition or something like this for yeah, Boston, and you could show the public, yep. here are eight different ways it's the city could look in 100 years. Which one do you want? Or you would get engagement. What, well, and what designers will do for a very small... Uh, yes, uh, sadly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hubert, well, uh, pedal I mean, to the metal, well, traction, well, actually, New, New York did that. Um, some years ago, I think it's about eight years ago, there was a, an exhibition in the Museum of Modern Art, uh, which was the product of a competition and uh, a, a beautifully briefed competition so that all the information about New York Harbor and the New York coast was there. Teams of architects came and landscape architects came up with really wonderful creative solutions, including oyster beds and old subway cars, etc. And you know, then eight years later, Bloomberg comes up with his wonderful plan, very well worked out, you know, priced $19.5 billion, and nothing is going to happen. Because? Because the political will isn't there um, on, on the scale that needs to fund that $19.5 billion. Now, it, you asked about sort of foreign, um, foreign examples. Well, I'm most familiar with the, the British model, which to a certain extent, still survives post-Thatcher and you know, post uh, the Tory ascendancy. Um, but what every th there is a national plan which is revised every five years, and it's fed from you know, small local plans being made, being fed up to the next, uh, the next level, um, onto county plans, and then regional plans, up into the national plan, and down again, so that there is a concerted effort at national level, which not only is a design issue, but it becomes a budgetary issue. Now, where are we going to put our money? Are we going to put our money into the defense of the, def the Thames estuary and all the communities surrounding it? Are we going to put it into the northeast, the Humber estuary, or the Tyne, uh, the Tyne River defenses, etc.? And it's also, uh, and you know, this comes back to the earlier point, it's not just a defense issue, it's how do you develop a, a region of your country in a responsible fashion with housing and retail and you know, science labs, etc. We here, we here in Boston, I mean, just one of the statistics which I found out, you know, f figuring out what's at risk here after Sandy, um, we have about 5,000 hospital beds, not partners, but all hospitals in Boston, acute care beds in, uh, in Boston, just Boston. And about half of those are sort of at risk. So how do you get 2,500 acute care patients out of this city in time? The other one, which comes back to this point, is that we have $1.7 billion worth of research just in the city of Boston uh, from NIH funding. That is about, I'm told, that's about half the total funding. So let's say we've got 3.4 billion. If you put Cambridge into the mix, you double that. So we've got $6.8 billion worth per annum of stuff that is at risk. And if that doesn't get us moving, what will? If only we could find a politician who would listen, learn, and lead. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know over here. I don't know. Here you go. Thank you. Why not identify yourself? I, I, I'm, uh, I'm Bob Culver, and I'm yeah. with uh, Sasaki. Only I also spent about eight years of my life heading up the state's development agency. And I think, I think this, the, and well, all of the, the discussion here, um, Boston doesn't have the money to do the multi-billion dollar activity that's called for here. That's, that's just a fact. Um, the state would necessarily be involved in financing this. And I don't know how many of you read the Herald and the Globe anymore, but if you do, you're well aware of the fact that we can't handle $13 billion worth of debt right now for the big dig. Um, and in fact- Or it, fix it, the T. <clears throat> or, or, or handle legislation put forward by the governor to try to bring about necessary improvements. There is no appetite. We have 351 cities and towns who believe that they have not been treated equitably, especially those Worcester West, uh, over decades. <clears throat> and many of them, believe it or not, have an attitude <laughs> about Boston. And I think that that is as big an issue 
uh, considering in, in the fair, fairness of, of, of all the issues which Tom has been good enough to open up here, that even though we could come forward with elegant plans, and I spend a lot of my time trying to figure out elegant plans, um, in my other life, understanding how these would be financed and how we begin to talk to sort of our brothers and sisters in the rest of the Commonwealth who in Worcester and Springfield and Pittsfield and North Adams and Greenfield and Lowell and Lawrence and New Bedford and Fall River, just to name a few, have felt like they've been underfunded with their various issues for years and years, is going to be an equal um, issue. One radical solution coming from them is take, if, if we went with Herbert's solution and we noticed that maybe it would take three to five times the big dig to do that, so we'll call it $50 billion, maybe $100 billion over time. Some people say, why don't you use it to incent people to move away from the coast and move to Worcester and move to Springfield and move to other areas that in fact at one time were very healthy cities and could do all of the functions that are currently happening in Boston. Just to add the other part of the states. I know, I'm just, I'm just saying that I think it's important. Boston uh, is yeah. asked to stand and deliver on something that they can't, they, they can conceptually deal with. But the financing of most any of this is going to take state bonding. Yeah. And we're already 13 billion bucks in debt and nobody wants to pay that. They don't, want to, they don't want to deal with current legislation. And here we have this coming at us and it's going to take a type of consensus that we've never attempted before as a state. So who's, who's gonna pay for it? And can we can we put the arm on Washington? Because all it's, your research is here. It's all, it's all the VC guys in Waltham that are going to. Well, do or <laughs> is is retreat cheaper? Is dispersal cheaper and more sensible? Well, <laughs> you, 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 you name. Yeah, that's right. Sort of disarming. Yeah. Uh, you name me one. Oh, anybody in the audience? Just name one. Uh, community that has voluntarily retreated from the place it calls home. I mean, there are plenty of uh, communities that have been evicted through war, famine, etc. There's but four of them in the middle of this state that were put underwater. Yeah. How voluntary? Was but not voluntary. Yeah. Not voluntary. Right. But as opposed to voluntary. Yes. So but, but I mean, if, you'd have but to if take. The city can't afford this itself. The state has to finance it, or even the, let's maybe federal. But uh, let's say state, and the rest of the state says. Bring it, to, bring it to us, bring I mean, it to Worcester, all your fancy research. The only thing I can suggest is that we get the uh, government of the Maldives here to sort of uh, help us consider how we move ourselves from a place of peril. Hey, I said earlier that, it, that I felt really optimistic from uh, putting this <laughs> magazine together. So I, 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 there's maybe time for one or two more questions, and I'd like to get something optimistic out of <laughs> So, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I'm Todd Larson, a freelance writer, editor, editor, and marketer. And there, I think there's another um, <clears throat> um, impediment toward this action, still trying to convince global warming skeptics oh. and all the skeptics, uh, you, you know, that this is uh, imminent. And I think there's still a lot of, you know, negative influence out there. Um, not only from dunderheads like Rush Limbaugh or those that trash Al Gore for his climate change findings, but intelligent, educated uh, columnists like George F. Will and Jeff Jacoby who think it's all about power, it's all about getting grants, it's all about having an anti-business itch to scratch. Even though, you know, climate change has been talked about since the 1950s. Uh, Peter Matheson, who wrote Wildlife in America, exploring uh, extinction of various species, was the first to say global uh, warming. And there was also this series of films for children that um, addressed the issue back in the 50s. I don't remember the name of the series, but some baby boomers might have remembered seeing it in their classrooms. You can see some of them on uh, YouTube. So I still think there's too much skepticism out there, and the less skepticism there is, the more we can move forward with this and even maybe convince some of those wavering uh, politicians. It's, that's important and big. I appreciate your comment. When do you think reality changes even those resistant minds? And there's a microphone. 
when the big storm hits. I think that's Sandy what happened. Hit. That's well, no, it hit New York. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, it didn't really impact Boston in the yeah, way that it hit y- New York, and and it's at that moment that New York <laughs> discovered that there were things called hurricanes. Do you think New York is on a different track now than Boston because of that? They're starting to be. Yeah. So competition could come into play here. That yep. I mean, big time. W- so it may be region by region that the skepticism gives way to action. Yep. Also, but reports like the rising tides reports that TBHA put out, that was last year. Um, Julie's told me that it's gotten a million hits. It's gone viral, as you know, in the media world. Um, and that has really pushed the conversation here in Boston. I mean, it inspired the work that we're doing at Sasaki, the research we're doing that's specific to Boston, um, the research we're doing in New Jersey. And I mean, it really, it pushed us to do that. And then it's also just pushed a much larger conversation in the Boston area. So many of these conversations have been happening in the past year that weren't happening um, before this report. And economic leverage has to come yeah. in. The insurance company is saying it's going to cost you a... I don't know. I don't know. That's good. Um, um, you know, I, I think we're getting, we're getting close to the last word, but I, I just want to take one in the back. Yeah, you were so polite up there with your hand waiting. The guy, the guy with the tie. Um, yeah. uh, my name is Shay Sims. I represent, uh, I work, I'm a partner with CB Richard Ellis, and we have been working on real-time immediate solutions to sea level rise and it has been site specific and it's so isolated so if you want something optimistic the crowd here provides me with optimism a lot of short-term solutions that i think we need to discuss and have support with the city on for code changes the bfd just to name a few of the groups out there that everyone has their own agenda but the long-term dialogue is so critical and i'm so proud that people are talking about it right now because we need a long-term solution. Uh, there are short-term solutions. There are quick recovery solutions. There's, hey, let's uh, drop our insurance uh, premium and just deal with the aftermath and not pay for it up front. Those are some people's solutions. That's not a long-term solution. Renee, I, I know you're going to wrap this up. Yeah. If I may just piggyback on that. I mean, I think this kind of event is absolutely essential for this to happen. For Leah and for everybody else who's working on this, you have to have public conversation and dialogue and awareness at your back. And the, the issue of the magazine with real solutions there, this kind of conversation that lays out the begin, at least the rudiments in this short conversation, but we can feel there's much more. If you put that in front of the public, yes, there's skepticism, but there's also just super rising awareness and people don't want to live in a flooded, destroyed uh, environment. I mean, this is a city people love and they don't want to be sitting here like damn fools. They want, uh, people want to use the time. And I think the more we give them to grab onto, to, to actively, concretely debate and shove off of, uh, the much greater the likelihood of it happening, even with the, the cost, which is enormous. So I'm so Let me just, well, glad so for this. And segue off of that because um, I, I m- neglected to mention earlier that there is another, in fact, there is another um, session planned here on January 29th. Um, I think that's uh, whatever that is. It's 6 o'clock, Wednesday, Tuesday, whatever it is. January 29th, bookend the month with uh, conversations about uh, sea level rise and resiliency. Um, sponsored by the BSA and I, I think Arup, um, who you mentioned earlier. Um, so there's another opportunity to come back and continue this conversation. I just wanted to say that. Can, can I just add to what you were saying, Tom? Because I, I mean, I, th- I think that you know this gathering is terrific. Um, what I also think is that, and it's partly to do with funding and building the political will, is that it's not just sea level rise that is a symptom of climate change, but there are there's heat, there's droughts, there's um, all sorts of problems all over the country which are different from our problems. If we talk about that as much as we talk about sea level rise, then we broaden our constituency and we get people from the southwest who are invested in this. We get people from the midwest who are involved with river flooding. We get people who are uh, from cities such as Chicago who are, have been suffering from heat waves, etc., who are invested in the same problem that we are invested. If we make this a specific discussion just about you know, how we protect the Boston Harbor, we're not going to get the funding uh, and the political will to get going on what we need to get going with. I know we have to wrap it. I know Renee will do this, but uh, Hubert Murray and uh, Chris Reed and uh, Nina, um, Chase, it's, it's been such a privilege to sit and discuss this with you, and I thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. I have nothing more to add. <laughs>